Good morning. Good morning. For any of you who don't know me, my name is Betty Reynolds, and I'm standing up here scared to death. <laughs> but I would like to start us off this morning with a prayer, please, if so if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning asking that you bless everyone here and everyone listening online today. I also ask, dear Lord, that you help us all remember that no matter what's going on in this world, you are still in control. I also ask that you remind us to have faith over fear. I also ask, Lord, that you bless Pastor Steve as he brings us your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I was asked to choose a word, a verse, and a song. The word I have chosen is joyful. I think if we turn on the news today, we don't think there's so much to be joyful about. But we, are, we do have plenty to be joyful about. You can look at your family, your grandkids, whatever it is in your life, you can always find something to be joyful about. And we need to remind ourselves that as we talk to others. If we can't be joyful, then how are we really going to bring anyone else to God? So I would like to just remind everyone to please be joyful. The verse I have chosen is Psalms 100. When I was growing up as a little girl in Georgia, and my parents had 10 kids, they always made sure we went to church, but I never really remember them going with us. But I do recall when I was about seven years old, and that was over 50 some odd years ago, that I was talking to my mom, and though I don't remember the conversation we had, I do remember what she told me. She told me to memorize Psalms 100. I'm not sure what that Psalms meant to her, but I did remember it, and I remember it to this day. And Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, and it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So what I will try to do this morning is make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Y'all stand and let's sing this together. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old
was awesome. Well, you've, you're uh, probably wondering who these ladies are up here. So just remain standing because we're all going to sing together. But I want to introduce you to Marilyn Mansfield and to Laura Edgar and to Jamie Good. And the one on the end belongs to me, Jamie Good. So that's a, that's a good thing. So we're glad to have them with us. They normally sing in a big old huge choir, and uh, they escaped this morning so that they could be with us. And we're glad that they're here. And we're going to sing some more here. This song um, you may know, and I think you do because we've sung it here before. It's called Cornerstone. So let's sing that together. Let me get adjusted. Sorry. Oh 
song for you and I want you to sing along. We sang this, it's been over a year ago. We did it uh, back with uh, Easter a year ago, but it was virtual, so you may not remember it. I don't know, but it's, it's a great song. Here we go. Talks about the living hope that we have through Jesus Christ. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
going to give Jose a minute to change instruments for us there. Don't you love it when he plays the violin? He just blesses my soul. It's awesome. This song is uh, called King of Kings, and uh, it's a relatively new song. You may have heard it on Christian radio, but um, it's really a good one. I think you'll enjoy it. Two.
Wow, thank you guys. That's awesome. Great job. Thank you, Mark, for working that out for us and uh, allowing us to have you gals come and sing. That was awesome. And isn't that a great song? You know, it, it's it's often that we're critical of some of the some newer music, but that uh, that song covers the entire gospel as you listen to it. So it's really really a great and wonderful song. Well, we're in Nehemiah. I'm still in chapter nine. And you might remember from last week, they had finished their project. Have you projected in your head when we're going to finish our project? <laughs> See, I have. I mean, I, and, and I tried to get Heather to understand they did their whole deal in 52 days. I don't understand the problem. Uh, but it's going to take us a little longer. Of course, they didn't have the city of Carrollton or any of those other people that had to come by and stamp things. So we'll take a little longer, but when we're done, we'll be just as excited. Uh, but in their excitement, it was so interesting to me that instead of a big celebration, uh, they went into a time of deep uh, contrition or repentance. And for like a third of the day, they just began to understand their situation in terms of their sinful nature. Uh, it's just one of those things that just sort of surprises you as you read it. You're looking for a big celebration, and you'll remember they celebrated early. They celebrated at the front end with Ezra when they first got back out of captivity. And then, they, of course, they celebrated when they finished the temple. But here, after finishing the wall, they, for a third of the day, just weep about their sin. Uh, I've, en I've, I've entitled this Grace-Based Help for the Hurting because that's what we offer. That's what that song talked about. It talked about grace-based freedom that you and I have. So right at the front end, I want to explain a few things to you about grace because, you know, the number one thing that is under attack in our nation, the number one thing that is under attack by our culture, and I could talk a lot about different political things. Every week, Donna says, are you going to get political again this week? And, uh, and, and I just smile at her, you know, say, do you know me? But uh, you could point at so many different things that are out there, individual kind of things. But here, here's the deal. I want to I wanna just break it down for you to understand. The culture is an all-out attack on grace on the nature of grace, on what grace is. As a matter of fact, it was Diedrich Bonhoeffer who was asked shortly before he was martyred by Nazi Germany, uh, this, this theologian, this pastor, was asked, how is it that the church allowed Nazi Germany to come about? And he said that it, it happened because they had no discernment about grace. They lacked discernment about grace, and they began to teach a cheap grace. And that's what gets sold. That's what gets sold to us from our culture. It's what I call a cheap grace. And as a matter of fact, there, there are things, legal things, there are things coming out of our culture that are asking us under the guise of compassion and tolerance to accept a cheap grace. So I think it's really important for me to explain to us what grace is because grace has five elements. I'm going to use an acronym. There it is. And, uh, and, and an acronym will help us understand the different elements within grace. And then I'm going to explain to you the, the attack on it at this current time and the importance of the church to be very discerning, as discerning as the nation of Israel was as we look at what, what they did. The first thing about grace, and I'm using the, the beginning of it, the G, means that, it, that we're creating God's image. Think about that. Just let that soak in for a second. We are created in God's image. It's, sim it's a symbolic relationship between God and man. God and man have the most unique relationship that there is. And it begins at inception. It begins at creation. And you are created in the image of God. 
Everybody that I know anything about that struggles with any kind of issue, psychological or any other emotional issue that you find, you find that they have lost their image, their God image within their head. You know, uh, we sell it to people and, and try to get people to understand, well, you need a good, strong image. Let me tell you what, more than a good, strong image, if you want a good, strong image, get a good God image. That God uniquely created you to be exactly who you are, the way you are, to be in this world as his ambassador. And so, and so God gives us an image, and it is symbolic of our nature with him. So a cheap grace would push that aside. A cheap grace wants to change the image of God in you. And it wants to make other gods. The second is uh, rebellion. The act of open resistance toward the established rule. One of the things about grace that, that we have to understand is that man created in God's image is also rebellious. We have a sinful nature. We have a fallen nature. And that fallen nature won't go away until we are on the other side of heaven. This side of heaven, you will always have a sinful nature. Uh, there was a movement back in the 80s where people were saying that they were reaching sinless perfection. That was a big teaching. And I used to always tell them, go check with your family. So I think you'll get a different opinion. This side of heaven, we're going to be sinners. There is a natural rebellion that comes from us. And when you recognize that and you know Christ is your personal Savior, that creates an area of repentance. You never would have gotten saved until you first recognize you are a sinner. It is that pivotal moment. I remember when, uh, when Ryan was little, he was in a revival. And, uh, and, and it was, they were having a, a children's night every night. And the, the revivalist would go over and he would tell kids stories. And, and Ryan would, uh, he, he was such an energy kid and always going. And so he'd, as soon as somebody would start preaching, right after the music, he'd fall asleep. And he'd wake up at the end and the, and, and the pastor would say, the evangelist would say, now if you love Jesus, you need to come forward and accept Jesus as your personal savior. And I remember Ryan would look at me and he goes, dad, we need to go. And I'd go, why? And he said, because I love Jesus. I said, no, you hadn't got it yet. And, and I, we wouldn't go. And he'd look at me kind of confused. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. Falling asleep every night. We're getting to the last night, and the guy's going to share his personal testimony and about getting an ice cream cone, and I don't remember what the whole story was, but, you know, he, he, uh, Ryan managed to stay awake for the whole thing. And I remember he turned and he said, Dad, we got to go. And I said, why? He said, we just got to go. And I'd say, why? And finally he looked at me and he said, because I'm a sinner. And I said, okay. And he said, well, we going? I go, no, you're going. If you feel like you need to go, you go. And I wanted to make sure, because he was at a tender age, I wanted to make sure that at that point he was really and truly going to understand Jesus. You know, you can get a child to understand. You go up and be with, you know, with Miss Marty and Miss Linda, be up there in the children's area. You're going to love Jesus. It's just going to happen. Kids love Jesus. But they have to know they're a sinner. They have to know there is rebellion in their heart before they can get saved. And that's why a lot of kids that came to Christ at a real young age because they loved Jesus, because they grew up in a wonderful atmosphere, and yet they turned teenagers and they recognize, I've never really accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I've never understood that rebellion. And that's a part of grace. The next part is the A, the altruism. A selfless concern for the well-being of others. That's what God has for you and me. Is, is He is altruistic and his word is true. And when you begin to understand and accept the word of God, then you understand your rebellion and your need for God. And you begin to understand in clarity the image that God created for you and who he created you to be. He created you male and female. And so you begin to understand things through the truth. And then the C stands for connection, a relationship in which a person is linked 
When you understand grace, you are linked with Christ through the Holy Spirit of God. When you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and he abides in you. He lives in you. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, the second touch from the Holy Spirit. You never get you never get any more of the Holy Spirit than that which you get at the point of salvation. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you get all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. It goes all the way down to the end of your soul, and it seals you until the day of redemption and becomes the instructor, the teacher with inside your heart. And you have a unique connection with God through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus taught about that. And then you are empowerment. There is this empowerment that comes with grace. and It is the authority and the power given from someone to someone. And when you come to know Christ as your personal Savior, you have an empowerment from God to be all that God has called you to be. Now, the culture is working against that as hard as they can. That full explanation of grace They would no more buy into that than the man in the moon. Here's why. They don't hold a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview. That's my new buzz catchphrase to help people understand what we're talking about. When we talk about grace, when we accept grace, when we understand these five principles of grace, they they serve as spokes that emanate out of a biblical worldview. That means that your worldview is made up from the process of what is in the truth of God. It means you believe the Bible to be the truth, God's word, the altruism truth of God. And as you work your way through scripture and you begin to understand more and more with the resident Holy Spirit teaching you, moving you along and you growing in your faith and becoming more and more atoned and attuned to who Christ is in you. That is the desire, that is the job, that is the purpose of everyone who has ever been born. To know Christ and then to know him and to serve him and bring him glory. Those that don't have a biblical worldview want to change that. Let me give you some surprising statistics. When I say biblical worldview, Bible-believing, People that that know their Bible, that read their Bible, that understand their Bible, I will tell you it represents, at this particular time, approximately 17% of the Christian community. 17%. That means 17% of us wake up and open the Word of God and study it and and, and, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to give us clear understanding of what it is, how we're to operate in our world, how to have this biblical worldview. By the way, that statistic is way down. It's going the wrong direction. Uh, In the last few weeks, for the first time in America, less than 50% of America claim to be Christian. And of that 50%, 17% are opening their Bible and studying it and doing their best to have a biblical worldview. The second thing that's alarming, 61% agree with the ideas rooted in the new spirituality. Not 61 of your culture, 61% of the church is sympathetic in in, in some sort of agreement in what is rooted up in the new spirituality and the new spirituality that is supposed to be enlightened that says we're to be tolerant of things, that says that we're to accept things, that we're to it were to just allow things to be different, to change. Cheap grace. That will usher in many worse things. 54% resonate with postmodernist views. See, the church has desperately lost their ability to discern what in the world's going on. We... We, during good times, fell asleep. We're going to see that out of the book of Nehemiah. And because we did, we didn't, we didn't educate ourselves in Scripture. We haven't followed through in our walk with Christ. We've accepted him and, and then kind of traced around this cheap grace. 
Because we, we want to be friendly. We want to be kind. We want to we appear not to be judgmental. And yet if you have a biblical worldview, certainly you will be kind. Certainly you will be generous. You will be gentle. You'll have all the fruit of the Spirit. But you'll also have a biblical world view. That you understand and you under know and, and you know. You know, I get into a lot of conversations with a lot of different people who have a lot of different thoughts. And, uh, and I love to start the conversation with them by just identifying to them, saying, now, I'm happy to talk to you about anything you want to talk about. And we can do it in a civil, straight up, man to man, however you want to, talk, however you want to deal with it. But you need to understand, going into it, I am going to present a biblical worldview. It's not a view that is judging you. It's not a view that is angry at you or frustrated with you in any way. You just need to understand it is a biblical worldview. And then it's always fun to say, what view will you be bringing to the conversation? Because they don't know. It's amazing how many people are spouting out information and they have no idea what their thought process is. So you help them along. You say, well, you're a, uh, you're a postmodernist. And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I am. 36% accept ideas associated with Marxism. Christians. If you have a biblical worldview, you spot that kind of stuff. If you don't, you get drug into it. Because it sounds plausible in the way that it is presented. It sounds natural and normal. It's, it feels like that's the groove, that's the way to go. You, go, you, you kind of go along to get along. And then 29% believe ideas are based on secularism. And that's our team. That's our guys. 17% don't understand what a biblical world... Only 17% understand what a biblical worldview is. 61% agree with some of the ideas of the new spirituality that goes on. 54 resonate with postmodernist views. 36% accept ideas associated with Marxism. And 29% believe everything is based on secularism. This is why the culture is in the mess that it's in. See, so often we'll stand here and we'll blame the culture for the way that it behaves. And we'll scream at the culture. We'll do things to protect ourselves as Christians from the culture. And I'm telling you, it's us that has let the culture down. It's not the other way around. I have no expectations of lost people of understanding what we're talking about. But the expectation of the Christian to understand it, yes. See, we have let our culture down by not understanding what a biblical worldview is by not understanding our own book. That's how we got here. It's easy to blame the other guy. I love Bum Phillips. Y'all remember Bum Phillips? Football coach. He had such great fun things that he'd say. They asked Bum Phillips one time who he thought the best coach was. And he says, well, he said, uh, he said I, I think the best coach is um, John, yeah, Don Shula. And uh, and he said, Don Shula. And they said, why would you say Don Shula? And he said, well, because he could take hisens and beat urines. And then he could take urines and beat hisens. That's a good coach. And that's who Don Shula was. And, and I, I loved to listen to how he talked. And one of the things that he said that I never forgot, he said, failure is not final unless you continually blame somebody else for it. Isn't that good? Failure isn't final. It's only final when you blame somebody else for it. Church, we've got to stop blaming the culture for what we're seeing happen. Time for us to take responsibility as the church and step into that responsibility and begin to do what it is the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to be on the move, not on the, not on the decline. And yet, we're not. We're stuck. We got stuck somewhere. And left behind a biblical worldview. Now, let me take you to uh, chapter 9, verses 23 and 25. You're going to see that the 
that there is this unique danger that comes when you're when you're living in the lamp of luxury. Uh, they're, they're talking about their descendants, and they talk about the number of the stars in the skies and how God blessed, and he, he allowed them to even, even overcome the Canaanites and take, and take them into a new land. And then he got to verse 25, and he says, And, and, uh, and our ancestors captured forfeited cities and, and fertile land, and they took over houses full of good things with cisterns, already dug, and vineyards, and oil groves, and fruit trees in abundance. And so they ate until they were full, and they grew fat, and they enjoyed themselves in all of the blessings. In all of the blessings. They took over a great land. God brought them into this wonderful land. He brought them out of captivity and then he gave them victory and he brought them into this wonderful land. Does this sound familiar? We were brought into a wonderful land. Do you, do you not feel privileged to live in America? You don't have to travel very far in the world to, to, to get somewhere, no matter how wonderful it is and how many beautiful attractions you cannot wait to get back. You cannot wait to, to touch down and be on American soil again. I still, think, I still think America has greatness in it, but it is no longer a great country. It has greatness in it. There is the ability for us to be great again. There is the, the ability for us to put on, uh, put on uh, sackcloth and begin to repent as a nation over some things that we're doing as a nation. There is still time. Why? Because God is a wonderful God and because God understands that we stray. There is something that happens to us when we are in abundance. We don't pay attention to what's going on and we live in abundance and we don't make strides of godliness. We just enjoy ourselves. And that's what the nation of Israel did. By the way, you notice they didn't have to work for anything. They just walked into it. Do you want to make a worthless child if you're a parent? Just give them everything they want. Just hand it to them. Expect absolutely no work ethic whatsoever. Just enable them, enable them to become worthless. I see them every week. Every week. They've come in with 34-year-old sons that hadn't left home. Daughters who won't speak to them. And what have they done? Just given them everything. Abundance. Anything you want. Anything you need. Anything I think you need. Anything you think you need. Doesn't matter what it is. Here, here, here. And we cripple people. And the nation of Israel became crippled in their success and it, because they didn't recognize it as God's success. After a while, when we live in a certain way, we think it's our stuff, right? Don and I will drive home to our home. We'll pull into our garage with our cars and we'll hang out with our stuff. And you know what happens to you? you begin to think that all belongs to you. You begin to think that because you live in a privileged land, because you, you live in, in, a, in a place that, that, that has all this stuff, that you're entitled to all that. And you forget to thank God for what it is you have. I'm not against anybody having good things. I, I love to see people with good things. Matter of fact, I like to look at what people have and I like to say, man, I wish I had that and you had something even better. Right? But it can't rule and reign over your life. If it does, you don't have a biblical worldview. You don't. Next week I'm going to talk about how we're going to pay for the building. Probably a good idea since I knocked the old one down. <laughs> and we're going to talk about your money. Right? Guess what? Some of you are going to come in with the right attitude. Hey, it all belongs to God. It's all his. God's going to want me to direct some of it this direction. That's good. See, when you begin to understand all your stuff belongs to God, 
then you can really enjoy it. Because then when it breaks, you can go, okay, God was done with me having that. Walk away. By the way, if, if you're not used to that, you know, I, I suggest you do like I do. Never buy a nice car. Just buy junk all the time. Because one thing I know about cars is they're wasting, they're going away, they're falling apart as you drive them. So that way when, when one dies on you, you can go, okay, number next. God's done with me having that one. Go to the next one. So there are these cycles of disobedience that the nation of Israel gets in. And in, in uh, Nehemiah 9, 20, uh, 26, it says, But despite all this, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who warned them to return to you. And they committed terrible blasphemies. They are recalling and, and, and putting, putting it out there to God that they understand that it was their nation that messed up. They're not trying to defend them, the, themselves at all. They're saying, no, it was us. And they, they move from God's image into rebellion. And, and when, when we are not sure of God's image, we make all kinds of mess of what it is that is our lives. And that's what the nation of Israel did. That's why when they got back, that's why Ezra wept openly. Because one of the first things they did when they were free is they began to disobey the law again. That's why Nehemiah becomes upset during the process. Because in the middle of the whole process, he finds out that they're taking advantage. The nobles are taking advantage of the poor. And he straightens it out because he's a great leader. But there is this cycle of disobedience within the human heart. Sin. Sin. We, we just we get caught up by other things. Other things begin to attract. You begin to spend your heart and mind in some other way, in some other place. And I, I'm not surprised at the disobedience within the church when you recognize that only 17% are even working hard at having a biblical worldview. When we step away from God, the, you know, I, I love it when I've had pastors tell me that somebody desperately sinned within the, within the body and they say, I don't understand why didn't they come and tell me? And I'm thinking, is that a serious question? Pretty sure you're the last one they wanted to know. But what we do in rebellion is open rebellion before God. And the nation of Israel understood that. And they said, God, no matter what you did, no matter how wonderful you were to our people, they rebelled. They killed the prophets because they didn't like what they were saying. And then they did all sorts of blasphemy. They, they began to make other kind of gods and they worship pieces of wood, metal, gold, other things other than you. Then in, in verse 27, there's a divine judgment that says, it says, so you handed them over to their enemies who made them suffer. But their time of trouble, they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven. And in your great mercy, you sent them liberators who rescued them from their enemies. God's nature is altruistic. God's nature in grace is to over and over again to extend mercy, to extend grace. But it doesn't mean that you can openly sin and there aren't results. Somehow or other, we have fallen into this arrogance, if you will, and I, I'm going to call it the price of arrogance that we're going to see in verses 28 through 30, where they think there is no bad consequences to the sin that we commit. And we look at it, it says, but as, as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight. And once more, you let their enemies conquer them. You think they'd get a clue. You look at the enemies that have conquered nations. And you understand the open disobedience to God. Abraham Lincoln would said that, that, that America would need no outside enemy. It would dissolve within itself because of the rebellion within our hearts. Our enemy is within. 
Our enemy is philosophical in nature. And so we fight against an enemy far worse than any other physical enemy that Israel ever, ever had. It says, yet, yet whenever your people turned and cried out again for help, you listened once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them many times. You warned them to return to the law, but they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. And they, and they did not follow your regulations by which the people will find life if only they obeyed. They stubbornly turned their, their backs on you and refused to listen. In your love, you were patient with them for many years. You sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets. But still, they wouldn't listen. So once again, you allowed the peoples of the land to conquer them. You think about the things that are conquering the nation of America. The violations of God's law. The abandonment of a biblical worldview that, by the way, those who constructed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights used a biblical worldview to build the document. And yet, again and again and again over our history, we stray from it. We move away from it. And I would love to say, but not the church, but not the church. But like never before, the church has been overtaken. It, it, it reminds me of, you know, growing up in Southern California, and, and as you would fly in now to Southern California, and I've been out of it for all these years, but as you fly into LAX, you're coming out of clear, clear sky, and you look down, and there's just an orange cloud. You can't see anything but orange. And it's smog. And you think, oh, man, I'm going to breathe that. I'm going to take that in. That's going to be in the air that I breathe. Well, I grew up breathing that. I mean, I, I, remember, I remember I would get up in the morning, and even the Indians that lived there before anybody else did, they would call it the Valley of Smoke. There were these magnificent mountains just at the base of Pasadena, California. Half the time they didn't even see, you couldn't even see them because of the smog. But a, a, an interesting hap thing happens when you get out of the airplane and you begin to walk around, you can no longer see the polluted air. You just take it in, breathe it in, breathe it out, and you forget all about the polluted air. The church of Jesus Christ has forgotten about the polluted air that we live in. There are things that if, that if you saw them years ago, you would be in, in shock. You would, there would be something that would happen to your sensibility and you would think that's wrong. And now it's in commercials. And it just flows by. It's just the nasty polluted air that we breathe. And so uh, where was I? What verse am I on? 31. Good. Uh, it says, but, but in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. And now our God, uh, the, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps us, his, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and leaders and priests and prophets and ancestors and all of your people. And from the days when the kings of Assyria first uh, triumphed over us until now, every time you punished us, you were being just. We have sinned greatly and you gave us only what we deserved. Life has consequences. Do you understand that? 
It has consequences. And the, the, the present plea here in this part of the prayer is they are recognizing that life has had consequences, hard consequences. Consequences that meant suffering, and sorrow, and pain. Sometimes even death. And yet they understood those consequences are there not because of anything God did wrong, but because of their rebellion. One of the greatest lessons you can teach a child is that life has consequences. And if you make a mistake, you must suffer the consequences. So many of us didn't learn that. I've told you before, I learned it at the hand of Corky, my dad. I turned 16, got my license, and by the time I was 16 and, and one day old, I had three tickets. And it wasn't my fault. Not a one of them was my fault. And I remember, I, you know, back then, you, you couldn't just take a class, you know. Back then, you had to go stand before a judge, and I remember standing before that judge and had to take my dad with me, and remember that judge leaning over and yelling at me about how irresponsible I was. Probably shouldn't be out on the road. And he kept bawling me out. And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, no, sir, no, sir. You know, just anything to get out of there. And, and finally, finally, he turned to my father and he said, Mr. Smith, is there any reason why I shouldn't take his license away till he's 18? Oh, man. I saw my dad turn into Johnny Cochran. I mean, it was the best legal sidebar I have ever witnessed in my entire life. He looked at the judge, he goes, I can't think of one. <laughs> Gone. No license. I remember I had, it, and I didn't even have a picture yet, it's just a piece of paper. And I had to <laughs> lay it up on the bench, and I remember the guy saying, if I catch you driving before you're 18, you won't drive till you're 21. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Consequences. You don't think that was a great lesson? That was an awesome lesson. That's a lesson I never forgot. Never forgot it. Of course, you make adjustments. I had a car, no license. Head cheerleader of the school, had a license, no car. <laughs> she lived three doors up. So for, for those next two years, I was taken to high school with a bunch of girls and me. It was awesome. Had my license back a year and a half before I told anybody. <laughs> they, they talk about the righteousness the, the, of God's acts in 34 and 5. It says, our kings, our leaders, our priests, our ancestors did not obey your law or listen to your warnings in your commands and laws, even while they had their own kingdom. They did not serve you. Though you, though you showed your goodness on them, and you gave them a large, fertile land, but they refused to turn from their wickedness. These would be identified as lifelong politicians. The righteousness of God is the only righteousness that we have individually, or as a nation. One of the things that is so very important for us to understand is we need leaders that, again, are public servants. We need leaders who understand that they serve under a holy God. Our nation needs a revival from top down, from bottom up, from church out. It needs to begin here. We need to be the ones that are affecting our culture instead of standing back and whimpering and crying because of what the culture is doing to us. We need to be out fighting against that culture, pushing against it, not, not with anger or frustration, but with the love of Christ in our heart, with a fulfillment of what it is that we are purposed to do as Christians. I, I, I can't tell you how many people have asked me lately, you know, would you go to jail if they... If they disavowed that? Would you do this if they did that? And the only answer is I have a biblical worldview. I will operate in my biblical worldview. And it's, it, it's up to God what happens with that. 
We either are left alive to operate within our biblical worldview or our life is snuffed out and we're martyred because of it. But that doesn't mean you don't have it because you're afraid. What are we afraid of? We serve the one true holy God. That's the purpose of grace. The beginning of grace is to have an image of God in your heart and in your mind. That you are led by God. He is protecting you. He is loving you. He is pushing you along in the fight. So, there's a flight from God. It is a common theme. It shows up again in verse 36. It says, so now today we are slaves in a land of plenty that, gave, that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. I think it finally dawned on them. We had to build a wall to protect ourselves. And we now know why. It's because we keep as a nation moving away from God. So we thought, okay, we'll build a wall. And they had to build a wall. And the wall had to be about 19 to 20 foot high. It had to be 8 foot wide. And it had to be all the way around the city to protect them from what? From the outside world. And now they're recognizing this is why. This constant moving away from God, fleeing God, although God is trying to help. And, he's, and, he's, and they say, the, the, the lush produce of our, of our slaves here is in this good land. The lust produce of, the, of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom, whom you have set over us because of our sins. And they have power over us and our livestock. And we serve them at their pleasure. And we are in, we are in, we are in great misery. You know, the, the only greater theme than man's disobedience is God's mercy and God's grace. It's the only greater theme in the Bible. Throughout Scripture, we, we run away, and then we're pulled back. Run away, pulled back. Why do we do that? What makes it difficult for us? And it's really the heartbreak of who we are, the heartbreak of our life, the trouble that's in our world. God didn't promise us a, a pain-free existence, and we don't have it. Um, from C.S. Lewis, Lightning in the Shadows, C.S. Lewis, after the death of his wife Joy, wrote of the despair and spiritual twilight he experienced. Part of the agony Lewis felt was the fading memory of her appearance. He began to forget what she looked like. He couldn't quite recall, and it, and it filled him with a sense of betrayal and deep anguish in his soul. And he would say, when we forget, we live as strangers. I believe the church has forgotten the voice of God. Forgotten what God looks like in the life of a, of a person who has come to know him as their personal savior. We have forgotten that and we've lived back in the shadows and we, we, we forgot what his voice sounds like and yet God is still speaking to us. We forgot it because we pushed away from it. We've abandoned it. Shadowlands is one of my favorite movies and it's a movie about C.S. Lewis. I love C.S. Lewis because he's so honest and fair about everything that he did. He didn't try to gloss over things with, with Christian platitudes. And one of the lines in the movie that was great, the vicar comes up to him after the death of joy and he says, Jack, it's okay. God knows. And in great honesty, in his deep, deep broken grief, he looks up and he says, of course I know he knows. I wonder if he cares. That's living in the shadow. That's living in the twilight of God's righteousness and who he is. Because of course he cares. And you go back to what grace is again. You have to understand again. If you're living in the shadows to bring you out of the shadows to bring light to it, you are made in God's image. You are the God-man. 
God created you uniquely in his image for the sole purpose of relationship. You are created for him to love. And you are capable of rebellion. And you are capable of hurt and brokenness. And yet, you are also capable of living a selfless life because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what it is to know God, to know God's love, and to give it to another human being. You also know connection. Connection with one another and deep fellowship with a brotherhood. And how to abandon the evil world and find your space with people who are like-minded, who love Jesus, who want to serve Jesus with you, who encourage you, who strengthen you, who don't drag you down, try to pull you into their mess. And then you are empowered. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, you are His. You are His from now until eternity. You have received the power of the Holy Spirit. Your life is sealed until the day of redemption. And if you doubt your salvation and from time to time you wonder if you are even saved, it's because you have not clearly understood a biblical worldview. When God comes into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit... He seals you. You can't do anything to change it. You couldn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to unearn it. There is an epidemic in our world of people who claim to be Christians and yet aren't sure about their salvation. You're not sure because you haven't developed a biblical worldview. And you're being victimized out in the world because you don't have a biblical worldview. And we're getting taken advantage of at every level. And in every place, in school, at work, at home, many of you. But you don't move away from your biblical worldview. You develop it. You make it stronger. You become a greater warrior for Christ in all things. That's what they knew. That's what they were making themselves aware of. They were letting God know, God, we know we blew it. We blew it many, many times. Our ancestors have. And if we're not careful, we will. And if you know the end of the story in Nehemiah, they do. Before the end of Nehemiah, he's yanking his beard out because decades later, after all of what they do, they fall back into the same mess. Church, it's time to bounce. It's time to stop blaming the culture for everything. Stop putting names to things that you think are going to change your life. If you have a biblical worldview, nothing can change your life in Christ. Now, your circumstances may change, but they don't change who you are in Him. And that is the only important thing in life. It's time for us to stand. I encourage you, stand now. I mean, right now, stand. Father, help us to be all you've called us to be. Help us to understand your mercy, your grace, how great you are, how wonderful you are, no matter how poorly we have done, how badly we have failed, how much we have missed you. God, you you want to fill us. You want to just push us out into a culture that's dying and dead and who has no hope except you. And you have given us as the hope for eternity for those around us. God, may we get up. May we go out. May we show that. In Jesus' name. Amen. They're going to sing to us. I just want us to stand. And I want this to be a time of commitment for you. I want you to think about what we can do as the church, what you can do as a Christian. And I want you to stop blaming everybody else for the circumstances. There's plenty to blame. There's plenty to go around. There's some pretty particular names you can tag with some bad things. But for what? If you have a biblical worldview, you know your purpose is in Christ. Your purpose is to live out a life that is honoring Him in all that you do. And it doesn't matter if the world goes to hell in a handbasket. You'll be out in the middle of it doing your part to change it. And that's God's not just command, but his desire for you. You want to live a life 
that has meaning and purpose, then go live it in Jesus' name. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to seated. I got good news from uh, Cuba. And so I've got a little thing I want you to see. Last week we prayed for uh, Pastor Carlos and uh, he had had a TI. Now they now know what that, that he had had that. How many of you had one of those? No raise of hands. Um, uh, TIA. And so uh, he's recovering well and the best way for me to show you that is to show you him. So here he is. Pastor. Hola a mis queridos amigos en América. Gracias por orar por mí debido a mi salud. Realmente he sentido sus oraciones y estoy muy agradecido a Dios por la sanidad de mi cuerpo. Me siento mejor y cada día tengo más fuerza. Los médicos me han pedido que descanse durante algunas semanas como parte de mi recuperación por lo que dependeré mucho de nuestro equipo de liderazgo aquí en Cuba para continuar el trabajo del ministerio ayudar a satisfacer las necesidades de nuestro pueblo cubano que está sufriendo tanto en este momento tan difícil gracias por su amor a nosotros y sus oraciones por mi recuperación así como por nuestro trabajo aquí en la isla le amamos, apreciamos mucho Dios le bendiga better uh and yeah you, you pray for his daughter because she has commandeered his phone and uh i know that he wants it back so just pray she'll stand strong while uh, he takes a little more time and heals up and i did have a discussion with uh with folks about cuba you know they're starving to death in cuba literally uh they showed me a picture and it was a a baggie, and it had two pieces of meat, I promise you, maybe three or four inches long, and uh, they had taken a picture of it, and that was their meal rationing for a family of four for an entire week. Um, they hadn't been hit by COVID on the island because they're isolated, and yet uh, in the government felt the need to open the island up for tourism, and tourists came from the European area, from primarily Italy. And now the entire island is infected with COVID. 
they claim to have uh, three uh, shots that take care of COVID, and they, but uh, they're saying that probably not taking care of it all that much. So they're limited on medicines. They're limited uh, in the hospitals and all of that sort of thing. It's actually a miracle that it was, that Carlos was able to be seen by the doctors and get into the hospital and get cared for as quickly as he could. But they're starving to death over there. And to compound that, yesterday, uh, Raul Castro uh, stepped down. The, of course, the brother of Fidel Castro, uh, the leader of that country. And he has stepped down because I'm sure he's scared to death. In Cuba, they have a forced by military. Uh, you have to be back in your home at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. They are, they're, they're not going to school. They're not going to work. Uh, they have a few hours in the morning. They can get out and they can try to get food, either by fishing or whatever means they can, they can to get food. Uh, the dollar is rich, but the peso is way, way down. Uh, food is costing three and four times what it cost before the food that is even available. And the sad part is the proclaimed Cuba people cannot get money from here into there and uh, you just, we just need to pray uh, and I know probably Raul Castro understood that the people of Cuba are probably within days of rioting and so we just need to pray that uh, something miraculous will happen that God will do something wonderful and uh, that uh, Carlos will be at the very forefront of that I know leading for the cause of Christ so we just need to pray for that little nation and uh, know that they're doing everything they can to find ways to to feed feed that nation and uh, you know even if it comes by way of a wicked wicked king they need to be fed so just continue to pray but I know you'd be happy to see Carlos up and about and uh, back to his normal duty duties of winning everybody he sees to Christ and so I want us to go and do likewise. Uh, I'm asking you to show up on Wednesday nights. We're having a great time on Wednesday nights. Uh, it's so good we can't record it. That's how good it is. Truth is I can't get anybody to record it. But, uh, but no, we're, we're going through uh, practically uh, how we are not to be silenced as the church and probably good not to record it. So I uh, want you all to come and uh, be a part of it. And it, I promise it's, it's, uh, it's going to be helpful. All right. Well, I want you to go have a wonderful day in Jesus. And I pray God puts all kinds of obstacles in your way. So you have to be everything he's called you to be. How about that? In Jesus name. Have a wonderful time. Oh, victory in Jesus.